Thanks for having me, Regina. Well, I wouldn't say there's no cause for concern. I think what we're trying to say right now is that the overheating risks um, are not yet material. This is not, we're not saying that there's an absence of overheating risk. Certainly there's a, there is an element of risk here. Uh, the, do, the two data points that you just mentioned, I think are indicators of that. But at this point, um, we're not as concerned about overheating risks as we would if, uh, let's say, uh, some other indicators would start flashing. Uh, for example, in, in the report that you just mentioned, we look at the, at the balance of payments, and, and so far, uh, there is an overall balance, uh, even though the current account has returned to a deficit um, that is fully funded, reserves are stable. Um, and yet there's also, uh, with regards to inflation, perhaps there's little evidence yet that perhaps um, inflation is behaving contrary to what the BSP says uh, re with regards to the transitory impact of, of train. So, you know, we, it may yet uh, uh, take some time for us to see uh, whether this uh, hike in inflation is indeed permanent, as, as some of the markets uh, have, have, have been concerned about. Christian, that's actually uh, one thing that's divided analysts that we've been speaking to, the question of just how broad-based is this consumer price rise. Uh, I want to know how big of a factor did global crude play into your assumptions? I mean, if you look at it, Brent, the international benchmark is now nearing $70 a barrel. Well, um, we take um, our, uh, our assumptions for, uh, for Moody's, Moody's global assumptions for, uh, for global oil prices, and those have, have not materially changed. So given our range of 45 to 65 dollars per barrel over the, over the course of 2018, we are actually implying that there is downside risk to oil prices uh, going forward. And in the, in the context of what we're talking about with regards to Philippines inflation, that also means that some of the upward pressures on inflation in terms of the pass-through from higher global oil prices, we'll, we do expect those to be muted towards the second half of the year. I want to know as well, is uh, strong credit growth a concern here? I mean, you talk about, when I mean, you look at the financial industry, you're seeing rising exposure to real estate loans, and that has been flagged as a key risk, especially off of the back of the triple R cut. What do you think? Well, indeed, I guess firstly, the, the triple R cut, I think, has to be uh, sort of understood. I think uh, there, there perhaps is a, um, a bit of a communications issue here. In the context of uh, higher inflation, and as you had mentioned, inflation breaching the inflation target, you know, would, have been, would it have been right, the right time to actually enact an operational change, such as the reserve requirement cut, which could uh, be easily misconstrued, and as you had mentioned, some analysts have already mentioned this, it can be misconstrued as policy easing in the context of higher than trend inflation. So I think that's one thing. The other thing too is credit growth. And here we, do, we have flagged this as risks to the banking sector, especially with regards to um, you know, some, of the, uh, you know, some of that lending going to real estate, which we think has cooled a little bit. You know, the BSP has been um, you know, quite concerned about this problem for a few years. And I think as a regulator has made their sort of concerns known to the banking sector. Um, the, the other thing, too, in terms of what mitigates some of the, those concerns is that the banking sector's buffers still remain intact. You know, we do have uh, fairly large buffers with regards to capital and liquidity. So at, at, at first blush, it's still, um, there, there continues to be enough resilience in the banking system against any downturn in asset quality from uh, the real estate sector. Now, Christian, let's talk about uh, trade tensions a little bit. Uh, talking about trade tensions between the U.S. and China, of course. Uh, all eyes on Xi Jinping today, who is addressing the BOA Forum in Hainan. I know that there's still a lot that's still unknown and uh, unconfirmed about the larger implications of a possible full-on full trade war. But generally speaking, do you think the Philippines is on the losing or winning end here? Well, I think it just, uh, we, we do need to sort of explain this a little bit. Uh, I guess firstly, um, beyond the direct impact on trade uh, from the sort of tit-for-tat measures between the U.S. Um, and China, I think we need to consider the broader context, and that is um, things other than the direct trade impact, as I was mentioning. Um, given the globally dispersed supply chains, you know, what this, this, uh, this sort of uh, trade war, if you want to call it that, uh, could actually impact things like uh, foreign direct investment decisions. So this is where uh, the, perhaps the impact on the Philippines uh, could, could materialize. 
Um, let's also not forget that the, the damage that could perhaps uh, be incurred if there was a full-on trade war. Once again, we're not saying there is one yet. Our base, our base case assumption is that uh, there will be some sort of resolution um, you know, going forward. But, uh, but just in terms of whether, when there is a, a trade war, let's also not forget that China has been an important source of final demand for countries in the region, such as the Philippines. So there could be indeed these second round effects that go beyond uh, the direct trade impact from tariffs and, and whatnot between, uh, with regards to the bilateral trade spat with the U.S. and China. In short, there's a lot of variables going into this, and until such tit-for-tat measures do are implemented, then it's really hard to say at this stage. Christian de Guzman, Vice President at Moody's, we thank you very much for your insights this morning. We'll leave it there for now.